Now let's look at the second era of environmental information. So as the environmental in movement evolved during the 1970s and the 80s, the role of civil society organization increased with the creation of organization like a Friend of the Earth, an Earth First, and other organization, but also they were working to make sure that they have an influence in the uh, political uh, space. And then there was also a new understanding during the 1980s about the problem of the first wave of environmental, of the environmental movement, and that led to the, crea to the uh, development of concepts like sustainable development, which emerged globally through the report Our Common Future. And that, as we mentioned, led to the creation of uh, the Rio Conference in 1992, and Agenda 21 is actually quite important uh, in this context, and this preamble of one of the chapters is actually signaling where things can go. So it's saying that in sustainable development, everyone is user and provider of information considered in the broad sense. And that's include data, information, appropriately packaged experience and knowledge, and recognizing that the need for information arises at all level, from that of senior decision makers, all the way to grassroots and individual level. So although in practice this was not happening immediately, at least the declaration is already there, and this also appearing very strongly in something called Principle 10 of the Rio Conference, so out of the Earth Summit. And Principle 10 is actually highlighting uh, three aspects that uh, since then are recognized as the foundation of environmental democracy. So let's notice what it's saying. Environmental issues are best handled by participation of all concerned citizens at the relevant level. At the national level, each individual shall have appropriate access to information concerning the environment that is held by public authorities, um, and then um, an opportunity to participate in decision making, and finally effective access to judicial and administrative uh, proceeding, including redress and remedy, shall be provided. So we see here three aspects, access to information, participation in decision making, and access to justice. Out of this principle, then, a few years later, the AHARUS Convention, or AHARUS Convention, was created uh, by the UN Environmental um, sorry, Economic Commission for Europe, or UNECE, which also covered the whole of the EU. And it's been a very unique uh, agreement that also covered the Central Asia, so it's many ex-Soviet countries joined in as part of it, and it's uh, covering today over 45 countries. So the Aarhus Convention is talking about improved access to information and public participation in decision making, saying about improving the quality and implementation of decision. It also uh, contributes to public awareness of environmental issues and give an opportunity to express its concern. So you still see here a little bit of the um, information deficit aspects, but also recognizing the role of different groups in participating. And uh, something important also within the Aarhus Convention is that it's calling for sharing information with the public using electronic databases and uh, sharing it through public telecommunication networks. In other words, they mean the internet. And as I've just mentioned, we're talking about the three pillars of environmental information. So access to the information, 
participation in decision making and access to justice, which together build up environmental democracy. So let's look at some examples of what was happening in the field at the time. The internet, remind you, was created in 1989, the World Wide Web, sorry, not the internet. But by 1994, it was already possible to see a system that uh, was established by a center in the, uh, in the United States and it's covering the Great Lakes area um, and it's also showing an area with environmental sensitivity between Canada and the US. So this system was just a demonstration of capabilities. The number of people of the general public that could access the information was very low. Another interesting example was created by an NGO, and that one is created by a friend of the earth who created a system where they uh, had access to uh, data about uh, pollutants, and that information was released as open data in the US, but not in the uh, UK. And therefore, the Friend of the Earth carried out a campaign where they done with data that was leaked to them from the Environment Agency, created Factory Watch, where you could put a postcode and it will be producing a map for you, as you can see there in the corner. And the system was providing different types of information and encouraging people to share it and to highlight it across different groups. So that, for example, you could then see the detail of the uh, pollutant and to get more information about what it is and even the full listing of a specific area. We have to consider who could access this type of information and because not a lot of the public was having access to it. Most of access at that time, even the late 1990s, was still held by uh, public bodies, research universities, and maybe journalists. But it was for campaigning purposes, so it was effective in that way. Very similar to it was information system that was, by that time, released from, um, from public bodies. So, for example, this is the first example of information about air quality that was released by the Department of Environment, Transport and Region at the time. So they were in, uh, containing the database for uh, clean air information. And as you can see, they uploaded information even a few years backwards, so you could follow the information all the way to the uh, early 1990s. And if you would click on any of those data sets, what you would get is this, a data set that show you the level of information for each hour of the day and for each uh, month. And while the data is not confirmed, you could actually use it in different way if you know what to do with it. The question is, who knows what to use this type of information? Um, and in each file, you would get one, you get data for one pollutant at one site for one year. So you get a lot of information overload and you need to be computer literate to be able to take this information and do something with it. Interestingly, but as a result of the work that you just seen, both by Friend of the Earth and by um, the other parts of the Department of Environment, there was the creation by the Environment Agency of uh, What's in Your Backyard. It was launched in 1998 as a demonstration of the ability to share information online. Um, and 
although as we said the amount of people on the internet was not as big as today still on the first day when they were trying to launch it the system fell over so there was a lot of interest in it the information itself was quite dreadful if you look that's the level of map that you would see online you could see that the interface is quite awkward and when you're trying to understand what's going on you see something very generic um, part of it is lim our limitations of screen size and computer at the time but also um, the our design issues with the specific application when you're trying to in include so much information about floods about other issues all in one place and w even when you zoom in you don't get much information interestingly also at the time you started to see organizations that are uh, providing community-led information so at the time um, the four communities of color in the US who were exposed to diff different chemical factories they were uh, creating something called the bucket which is a simple tool for um, collecting air samples when there is uh, breaches of uh, from the chemical factory nearby so that can be sent <coughs> to an analysis in a laboratory and at the same period uh, at UCL we were experimenting with uh, providing access to information to the public so uh, information that was not available in the in a public forum by the Environment Agency uh, through a workshop we could actually work as chauffeurs or drive the information system for the community member in this case in Wandsworth in order to show them the type of information that is recorded about their area and have a discussion about environmental information um, and environmental action of new development in their area similarly those developments were not just happening of course in the UK there were also systems such as the um, Envirofact which was an early system by the EPA to provide wide access to environmental information by the public and as we progress through the 1990s and getting into the 2000s this ability of producing online maps became more available to more NGOs so while the example that I showed you from Friend of the Earth required a lot of technical ability and there were two researchers there who were doing fantastic job in implementing a system although it was very difficult to implement such a system and required quite an, um, a lot of uh, hacks and solutions by 2003 we could see systems like this one created by London 21 Sustainability Network which was the first example of a green map this is a bottom-up map of sustainability activities that created by community and they were deciding which type of an activity should be uh, recognized as a sustainability activity that should be mentioned notice however that there are still issues so for example the navigation of moving the map north west south is not very intuitive and that of course limits the number of people that can use it or understand how to use it in an extensive way compared to what we have today this is more complex to use and also things that appeared at the time were systems like this one a noise model of london which became available across the uh, country were a, a model noise following a noise directive from the eu uh, created this uh, sort of information so you could enter a postcode 
and then you see this type of information. You can look at this map and ask exactly where is it. Notice that the map doesn't have any type of information um, of street names and you also need to ask yourself what exactly the numbers mean and that's something that we'll notice in a minute. So the Environment Agency of course had to continue and evolve the system so while the system that I showed you a decade earlier in 1998 was uh, set in one way by 2008 the second or third version of the system um, of what in your backyard was created and it's uh, allowing a bit more detailed map although still not completely clear and it's allowing the pollution in inventory so the information that you've seen on the uh, friend of the earth website is then was happening and and you could actually see specific information such as the uh, type of pollutant that exists in a specific neighborhood there is also things like the uh, pollution inventory that evolved over time and provide detail like this one but let's think what are you looking at notice that it you are looking for a postcode and the postcode is an area where we are looking at a, a basically a supermarket a, one of the big uh, supermarkets and you have to look at this information and consider what is it that you are looking at in terms of the numbers that you see here. If you are not uh, very familiar with uh, specific, specific aspects of what pollution mean, you would not recognize that actually this is from the petrol station in the forecourt of the supermarket this is not something obvious to note. So what we can see however by uh, the mid-2000 we are seeing uh, two big differences. First of all we have a system like Google Maps that changed the visualization and the utilization of the web and here's the new green map of London 21 from the mid 2000 when it became available to represent it in Google Maps and you can see that it's much more familiar and actually now you are starting to recognize the mapping as something that would work even today and also there were efforts such as uh, OpenStreetMap that allow people to start creating their own information. So OpenStreetMap is a worldwide system of people creating their own maps of different areas. They are, and then they can use the information completely for free. Um, and that's also led to community groups um, creating their own uh, systems and their own achieve in their own systems and this is an example from Transition Town Brixton that we're using an ability of Google Maps to create your own map in order to present this information. So by that period we are starting to get into this two-way ability of creating the information and that leads to a new ideas for about who and how in environmental information should be produced. So this uh, was signified in 2008 in an event that was talking about 10 years for the Aarhus Convention and Professor Jackie McGlade who was then the head of the European Environment Agency, uh, she's uh, also a professor at UCL, um, she was pointing out that often the best information comes from those who are close to it and uh, it's important to harness this local knowledge. And shortly after, the European Environment Agency uh, launched a system for uh, releasing 
um, for collecting information from the public about the quality of uh, water and uh, beaches and that is the one of the first example of a citizen science or the participation of the public in collecting environmental information for monitoring at the European level. And that information was also demonstrated in systems like the um, online mapping of a mapping for change an organization that was created at UCL and allow communities to collect their own information. So to summarize this second era, we can see public access to environmental information is seen as prerequisite to participation and, civil so and also for civil society organization are operating as intermediaries to do that. We have seen also how the internet from, uh, especially from the end of the 1990s, is becoming a major route for sharing information and also that, that the information is being uh, presented in a way that it's mostly relevant to experts, although towards the end of the period uh, we are seeing a movement towards making it more accessible. But we can say that more generally, here we see information by expert for the public, but in an expert form. And as one community member mentioned to me um, in one event, this is not community information in community language. In other words, what we can see is that we continue to have the expert discussing with themselves, and maybe the public have discussion with the decision making, but there is some sharing of information where the experts are passing the information to the public.